in the name of Jesus. God, we set out our plate today. We set out our cup today that you fill us to an overflowing, Father. Yes, God. That we bring about a change in the atmosphere, Lord God. Yes. That we change, bring about a change yes. in our homes, yes. Father. Yes. In our families, Lord God. Yes. Wherever we go, Father, yes. in the name of Jesus. Yes. God, we thank you. Thank you Lord God, Father. And we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Jesus, amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So often, we rush through life. Whether we work in the home or outside the home, it's like we're constantly on the go. We get up in the morning, we know we have our routine, we got to be to work by certain times, we know this, this, this has to be done by a certain time so that we can get our day started. But as I was laying before the Lord and I was asking the Lord, what is it that we need to hear? The Lord spoke one word to me and he said, pause. And I was like, okay, Lord. Okay. You know, make that, you know, okay. Keep speaking to me, Jesus. And he said, pause. And so often we're going and going and going and going and going. We're rushing from one task to the other. Children in sports. Dishes have to be done. All kinds of tasks face us throughout the course of the day. But the Lord says, pause. You know how we put a push pause on a movie? We want to go run to the bathroom. We know we're going to make it through the whole movie, so we push pause. We can do it in the movie theater, but we can do it at home. So we push the pause button, and we go, we go tend to our business and come back. But the Lord says that he needs us to pause. The word says to be still and know that he is God. And that he will be exalted. Amen. And even though the earth is groaning for the return of Christ. So right now we're in a pause. Because God is giving this opportunity for those that don't know him to come into the saving knowledge of who he is. And some of us is like, we're ready, like, Lord Jesus, how much more can we take? How much more can we go through? How many more trials do we have to face before your return, Lord? And, G and the Lord spoke to me. He says, I'm coming. Saturday morning, I heard it as clear as day. I'm coming. And it's like, so the earth is groaning for the return of Christ. Amen. But in the meantime, what are we supposed to be doing? We're still supposed to be testifying of his goodness. We're still supposed to be letting our light shine. We're still supposed to be interceding for others. Amen. Our life is not over. And God is saying that in this pause that I'm giving the world to, to wake up, in this pause during this pandemic, this pandemic has changed how we do life. Because it's not the same as it was last March. Amen. Last March when we shut down, everything shut down, churches and everything, and now God is saying, do I have your attention? I didn't cause this pandemic, but I'm going to use it to my glory. That's right, that's right. So are you paying attention now? Have you stopped long enough to think about what you're supposed to be doing, what your purpose is? And everybody's purpose is to tell the good news of the gospel. Now it's going to be unique how you do it, but that's the purpose for all of us. It's to spread the good news of the gospel. People try to make this purpose thing such a great thing when it's really very simple. We are here to live a life of Christ. We're here to be conduits of his grace and his mercy and his love. Amen. That's our purpose. Now, how it pans out is looks different for Minister Dominique, the Sister Deidre, the Minister Brandon, but we all have this purpose to fulfill yes. for the Lord. Amen. So it's not a great mystery. Now, he's given us all different gifts and talents, and Lord God, show me what my talent is. Show me what my gift is. But I know my purpose. My purpose is to live a life of Christ. My purpose is to let my light shine. My purpose is to tell others the good news of the gospel. Amen. But God is saying that my people, the people of God, we need to learn to be proactive. So I came home from work Friday, 
and I was talking to my oldest daughter, Deborah, and I said, Deborah, I had a revelation today. And I said, you know what? I'm a reactor. And she just bust out laughing. She said, you just figured that out? And she said, we already knew that. It's like, well, excuse me, he has to laugh so fast. It was like the, I mean, the Lord just started ministering to me that you don't have to react to everything. You don't. The enemy sets about traps for us throughout the course of the day to cause us to react. And the Lord is saying, pause. You don't have to react to that. You don't have to respond to that. The one task that I do not like working with is emails. I can't, I, I mean, they just, it's just too many. It's like, oh my goodness, one more request. I can't stand it. Right? So I, I was like, okay, Lord, you got to help me with this. I do not, I do not like it. Right? And so, and especially if I get a nasty email. You know, they get snarky in their emails, mm -hmm. and I want to get snarky back. <laughs> but the Lord says, pause. You can't react like that. Mm -hmm. Take a moment, take a deep breath. And so often, what does the enemy do? He sets out mm -hmm. to set us off. Mm -hmm. You know, those triggers that we know. You know what I'm saying? And he'll push that button, and what, is, what do we do? We react to it. And God is saying, I need my people to pause. I need you to pause a moment before you do something. And pause and remember what God has brought you from before. Yes. So that when the enemy comes threatening you, remember, what did I do for you before? Right. I'm the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Thank if I did God. it that day, I'm going to do it for you Amen. again. If Thank you trust God. me. But what do we do? We let people push our buttons. And before we know it, we have moved out of peace and tranquility on the way to work and we let one little action just set off our day. And before we know it, we're not went to 100. And I'm going to testify that that's me sometimes. And it's like, Lord Jesus, help me not to be a reactor. That every time my children say something, I don't have to react to it. That I learn to say, they say something, it's like, okay, God is in your hands. They tell you something else, okay, God is in your hands. Because God, I cannot carry this. God did not equip me to carry this. He didn't. And so the Lord is saying, I need my people to pause. And, you know, and stop reacting to everything that we hear and see. We get panicked. If they're talking about shutting down, we're going to run and get all the supplies we need. And we want to be prepared. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But I had to stop by the store this morning. So then I called my girl and I said, guess what? I see some disinfectant spray on the shelf. It's Walmart brand. It's $2.98. So if you and Brittany go, because it's one per household, but if you two go, we're in a separate line, pay for each other separately, we get two cans in the house. Because then we're able to bless somebody else. So somebody else say, I don't have no disinfectant spray. You say, I got some I can share. Amen. 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 But what do I do? We react to what we hear. We react to what we hear. And the Lord is saying, what does my word say? What have I proven to you time and time again? So let's look at 1 Kings. I'm going to start at chapter 18. I didn't give this tonight, but I'm going to start at chapter 18 because it was really powerful. So, and this is your homework. I want you to go home and read it because I'm not going to read all of these scriptures this morning. First chapter, First Kings chapter 18 talks about the, my New Living Translation says the contest on Mount Carmel, okay? So, it was in the third year of the drought. So can you imagine, I mean just think about this guy. Can you imagine if we here on earth did not have rain for three years? What would we do? Lose our natural mind. Uh -huh. That's, that's going to be our first reaction, amen? Uh -huh. So then in the third year of the drought, okay? And so King Ahab is sending people to look for grass to see if you find any grass to, to keep the livestock so that we can have food to eat, okay? And Obadiah was, his, was in charge of the palace, but Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. And what, at one time when Jezebel tried to kill all of the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden 100 of them in two caves. It says he put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. Okay, so oh, 
So Ahab is like, we're trying to find grass for the livestock. But at the same time, he was hunting Ahab, and he was hunting Elijah because he blamed Elijah for what they were going through, and it wasn't Elijah's fault. So then I'm going to go up here to... So when Ahab, when Elijah saw... Ob Obadiah saw Elijah, excuse me. Obadiah saw Elijah, and he went to meet him, and he fell down and honored him. Elijah told Obadiah, go back and tell Ahab, King Ahab that Elijah is here. Obadiah was like, what are you doing to me? Because if I go and tell him, he's been hunting for you. And if I go and tell him that you're here, and then the, the Lord takes you to some other place, then I'm going to lose my life. But he says, I, I will meet him here today. Amen? So then I'm going to go ahead down. So verse 16, so Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I'm in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 now. Go on to 18 first. And Elijah responded, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets of Mount Carmel. So then it goes on and he's, Elijah's asking the people, how long will you stay in the valley of indecision? How long will you be between two opinions? Okay? It's either you're going to, if the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But you've got to make up your mind. And the people didn't respond. Okay? So now, I'm down to verse 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your then call on the name of your of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God, and all the people agree. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it. And call on the name of your God, but do not set fire on the wood. So they did that. They followed his instructions. And so it says, so they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a God. Perhaps he is daydreaming or is relieving himself. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted louder and following their normal customs, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raised all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Now listen to what he's saying. So then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about three gallons of water. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the, over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said, and that water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time of offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. 
Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground and cried, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kashan, that took them down to the Kashan Valley and killed them there. So did you see how the Lord did a mighty work through Elijah? Amen. He told them, take the bull, lay it on the altar, cut it up to pieces, don't put any wood on it. And then they called for Baal, and Baal didn't answer them because Baal couldn't because Baal is dead. Our God is alive. Amen. Amen. And they cried out to the Lord. And God sent fire from heaven, lift up the water, the dust, everything, consumed it all. And this is where the power of the pause comes in at. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. So, when Ahab got home, and I'm starting at verse 1, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Just that fast, Elijah forgot. Hmm. Right. Just that fast. And Elijah had taken a moment and paused right. and remembered what God had just done. But he let the threat of this woman right. make him run. So verse two says Elijah. No, verse three says Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Didn't God just show Himself mighty? Uh -huh. Didn't God just do a miraculous work? And how often do we treat God like this? God will deliver us when our backs was embedded in the wall. And he'll make a way out of no way, and then another trial will come, and our flesh starts reacting. And God says, "Wait a minute, pause. Remember who you serve." I am the God of Israel. I am your provider. I am your redeemer. I am your soon coming king. Is this too hard for me? Is it too hard for me to save your unsaved loved ones? Is it too hard for me to raise you up off of your sick bed? But Elijah, just that fast, he forgot. And the Lord is saying, if my people would pause and just remember how I have kept them in the midst of this pandemic. Hallelujah. How I kept them Hallelujah. while they're watching their loved ones go through yeah. chemotherapy, Jesus. radiotherapy, whatever the case may be. How I was there for you. Yeah. But why do we tend to forget the God that we serve? So Jezebel issued this threat. Now the Lord had just proven to him, they cried out to Baal. Baal couldn't even burn up the, the offering, the sacrifice. What made Elijah run? Because he got caught up in his flesh and let fear enter in. That's why we as people of God, we have to be proactive. We cannot wait until we're in the fire to start praying. That's why the Bible says yes. to pray without ceasing. Yes. The Lord has already told us that we're counted as sheep for the start of daily. So we need to know that we're involved in spiritual warfare yes. on a daily basis. Yes. Not every day is intense. But every day we need to be seeking God. Yeah, God yeah. Every day we need to be in our prayer closet. Yes, every day we need to be in our word. Yeah. Sucking up his word and letting it saturate us. Mm. So that when the trials come, we're ready. So let's yeah. keep reading. So, so Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. Now look at how far he's going. I mean, he's, he seriously ran. Jezebel said, if I promise you that if I do not kill you, if, if the, by this time the next day, if you're not dead. And he just responded to the threat. What did she say? She said, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was like, I'm not waiting for it. I'm running. Forgetting the God that he serves. So it says, he, then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree. And I know the King James Version says something different, a different juniper tree. And prayed that he might die. 
I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my wife, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Only God could have done that. Right. Amen. That's right. We expect God to move. And we, we try to limit how he moves, and God can move however way he wants to. Yes, he Amen? Amen? So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, for the journey ahead will be too much for you. So right there, showing you that he they was preparing Elijah for the journey ahead. Yes. And the Lord is saying, I have given you the tools today for the journey ahead. He told us that in the last days, all the things that we would suffer. But he says, but to know that I'm coming back. And he's coming back a righteous king. A victorious king. Amen. And he's going to rescue his people. Yes. And then at his appointed time. Amen? Amen. So he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. The mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed everyone in the province. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Like God couldn't keep him. Right. Amen? Amen? Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint, Je then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of a word that I can't pronounce, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Hallelujah. Look at the power of our God. So Elijah was threatened. And he ran. And then he went to a place and God says, what are you doing here? And then he's going to tell the Lord all that the people have done like God didn't already know. But in the meantime, God provided sustenance for him. And gave fed him enough that he was able to make it 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. And then we look for God. And we say, God, we want to hear from you. Right. And so it says the Lord wasn't in the noise that came from the rocks being torn from the torn loose. And the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And he wasn't in the fire. These grand examples. But the Lord came in a gentle whisper. Yep. But what happens when we're running to and fro or running to and fro, we have to hit the pause button. Yeah. So that we can hear from God. We look for these great exploits from the Lord. And God is saying, I'm coming to you in a still small voice but you've got to be in that place that you can hear me because we are taunted by the enemy daily we're all threatened in some form or fashion or another the, light, the lights are going to go off we're not going to be able to make the car payment how am I going to get the clothes that the children need when the Lord has already established in his word that he will supply all of our needs so the Lord is saying to his people today, I need you to pause and remember who I am. There is nothing that you're facing. There is no task 
that needs to be completed that I can't help you with. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. He said, I gave him to you to be a helper, yeah. to walk alongside you, to help you when you're at the workplace, in the grocery store, at home, when you're dealing with a difficult situation. The Lord says, I am a very present help in the time of trouble. Yeah. And when we let ourselves get frantic and worried and anxiety creeps in and we get depressed and then we hold our heads down, we say we can't pray. And the Lord says, but my people just pause. Yeah. And you would just be still yes. and know that he is God, that he is able to meet every need that you have yes. today. Yes. There is nothing that you're facing that God cannot handle. Yes. Thank the Lord. Nothing that you're facing that God cannot handle. 